All right, so uh, thank you, Moshin Sensei, for the introduction. As usual, I'm always excited to come here and talk about something that is I'm very passionate about, and also it's you know Buddhism stuff as always. So it's always passionate topic for me, uh, for reasons that you all know. As Moshin Sensei said, I did uh, finish my PG. Officially graduated uh, last October, so it's a very exciting time for me to be able to uh, move on from it, actually. But uh, yeah, a lot of the stuff that I talk about in my uh, in my presentation are oftentimes related to either stuff that I've done during my doctorate or there are sometimes they're actually part of my PhD and I kind of like take little puzzle pieces out together and present it to all of you in kind of like a little bite size format. Um, so it's always something that I'm, I'm very proud of and I love having these discussions on these topics. So today the topic is anthropocentricism which uh, you can also pronounce anthropocentrism, so without the CI right here, so it's up to you. I say anthropocentricism because that's just the way I've always said it, so um, if you don't like it, well. So today, anthropocentricism. First of all, what does it look like? What is, does it smell? What does it eat in wintertime? So we're all going to talk about the gist of what this thing is. What is this massive beast of a word? Then specifically today, I want to focus the presentation on, yes, talking about what anthropocentrism is, but specifically about how Buddhist scholars have, and authors in general, have engaged with that particular topic. So I'm not, I'm trying to move away. All of you are going to notice a theme in my presentation. It's something that is very important to me. Um, whenever I try to provide quotes or passages and like these kinds of stuff, I always try to do it from Japanese authors, specifically from Japanese authors from different eras uh, to try to see how the concept might have evolved, but also to show in, the, in this context, like Monchin Sensei was saying, that anthropocentrism is actually like, they don't use that word, but the core principle behind anthropocentrism is actually very much at the center of Buddhism and of, you know, enlightenment and all of these ideas that are core to all of our practices. And um, I think that to show how consistent engaging with that topping has been from different perspectives, from different authors, a different era, just kind of like, you know, like anchors the point in that it's actually very central to Buddhism overall. Um, so today, what I'm going to do is just provide uh, just a few passages from Saigyo, Dogen, and Abemasao uh, that engages with that topic uh, on different, I, I guess, a different kind of level um, to make it as comprehensive as possible and straightforward. I, in all cases, like I could provide tons of passages on this topic. I choose one for each author to try to make it like as concise and also uh, make sure we, we stick the time. Uh, but if you dig a little deeper after today, when we understand what's anthropocentricism and you, you're reading your own text, you're reading the sutras, you're reading particular authors, you'll, you, you'll be able to notice like, oh, I see what's happening there. And you can excavate your own passages that make sense to you. And again, always finish with what can we learn for this, try to make it relevant to our current modern circumstances. So first of all, what does it look like? So anthropocentricism is, uh, so Erica Fudge talks about it as the belief that the human is at the center of all things, that the world revolved around him. Um, Kennedy, I forgot what his first name is. Jonathan Kennedy uh, describes it as our species, so the human species holds dominion over nature. The one of the, I guess, easiest graph to understand anthropocentricism is, I believe, this one. So you have a circle that anthropocentricism refers to human beings and the state of being human. So anthropo is human. Like Mochin Sensei was an anthropologist that kind of focuses on, you know, this like humanness uh, as part of. So anthropo means that. Centricism is it centers on. So we all know something like egocentric, like it focuses on ego. Uh, anthropocentric is it focuses on the human. And in this case, as the quotes have said, it's the belief that the human is the center of all things. It's kind of, it has dominion over all things. So anthropocentricism, then you can extend to different kinds of centricism that just becomes more and more and more inclusive. But the anthropocentric 
core belief goes along something like this, is that the world revolves around the human, the world is for the human, the world is created by the human, and the only perspective that counts is the one of the human. So humanness is the standard against which everything is evaluated and acted upon. So that is like the core idea behind anthropocentrism is the human is kind of above all, everything is of the human, the human is the measure of all things. It's centered around the human experience of the world. So anthropocentrism, the, the belief, the assumptions, the anthropocentric assumptions that we have of the world creates multiple things. So it creates human-centered histories. So for example, we know that if we took a course like a, on the history of the world, what are we learning? We're learning about particular humans, and most of the times they are men, and how this, these human change history with their actions. And this human did this, and it led to this. And then this human responded to this, and it led to this. It's like all of our histories is it's been forged by the actions of humans. So that's an anthropocentric view of history. It focuses on the human, what the human did. It's for the human. The human is the biggest mover of history. Uh, also human-centered truths, human-centered religions, human-centered interactions. Um, for that one, I'm going to give a little bit of an example. Uh, it's actually a Chinese story, if I remember correctly. It's one of the many stories about the Duke of Lu. Um, it's an ancient story that basically says in a nutshell that he had a, a parrot that was just, it was like a divine bird that was like talking and doing a bunch of different stuff. And he was so infatuated by the bird. He like, you know, put it into a cage and did this and did that and all that stuff. And eventually the bird died. And then the... Um, his attendant came into the room and then the Duke of Lu was like, Hey, like, I'm so sad. My bird died. What happened? And the story kind of goes like, well, you didn't give the bird what the bird needed. You gave the bird what you thought it needed. You focused on you. Uh, and therefore your interaction with the bird was not based on the bird's experience, the bird's needs, the bird's perspective. It was based on you and how you think you should be treating it. And therefore it led to the death of the bird. And you see things like that also in interactions when, you know, like, uh, I'm going to put it out there just as a, like a food for thought, but sometimes, you know, like we have pets and then when we have pets, we think of the pet of like, oh, like I don't want to do this to the pet because I wouldn't want this to be done to me. You, you take your experience as a human being and what matters to you as a human being and then you think that all of the rest of the world should be receiving that same kind of thing. And that is what also matters to them. So that is also embedded in anthropocentrism, that the perspective of the human is the one that counts. And the measure of all things is measured against what the human thinks and what the human believes, uh, which also leads to the creation of human, human centered structures. And that's something we're going to talk about a little later. And all of that, it also means that anthropocentrism values things that are human-like, so human-like intelligence. And now it's the typical quote from Einstein of like, if you measure a fish by how it climbs a pole, then you're going to think that the fish is not intelligent. Yeah, because we have an, an understanding that intelligence is whatever the human is. It's anthropocentric. And therefore, whatever is not like the human in the way it thinks and the way it operates, it's not intelligent. Uh, also, human-like features attributes, qualities, etc. So anthropocentrism is actually, I think it's one of the assumptions that we have in the way we operate in the world that is the least engaged with. And the, the more, uh, I think it's one of the assumptions that we have that is the most ingrained in the way we interact with the world. And that's why I'm choosing to talk about this today. So just a sample of the consequences of anthropocentrism and we could, I could do a presentation on each of every single one of them individually, but I'm just kind of throwing it at you here and hopefully we can just have conversations about it later instead. The first one is environmental destruction. So the narrative would go something like this. Since the world only exists for the benefit of the human, then extracting its resources for the benefit of the human is normalized and it's even encouraged. 
also animal cruel, cruelty or extermination. So since non-humans are inferior and subordinate to humans, it's normalized and even encouraged to tame, dominate, eat, and exterminate them, especially when doing so benefits a human. So we see tendencies here. But this is not just the anthropocentrism doesn't just have an impact into the way we engage with the world and like, you know, nature and animals, whatever, but also between us. Because, for example, legacies of colonialism, you can see that portraying cultural customs as more savage or bestial justify killing or seeking to civilize others for the betterment, the betterment of humankind. So again, we have an idea of what humanness looks like. And then I would encourage people to ask the questions like, who gets to decide what humans look like and think like? And I think, you know, that tackles another topic we're not going to go into. But this idea that like, oh, if we're more human than these other people, then it kind of justifies doing other things to other people that are perceived to be less than human. So this idea of anthropocentrism has also repercussions between humans and the way we interact with one another and also justifies different kinds of oppressions. So for example, like I just said, since specific characteristics are perceived to be human-like, and the typical one that comes to mind that I think is almost cliche at this point, but it's also true, uh, is reason, right? So the capacity to rationalize reason in a way that is, again, human-like. So if we take that characteristic, and then we say that to be perceived as lacking such characteristics, such as reasons, make you less human, and justifies oppression and punishment for the sake of reform. So we all have, you know, stories, you know, there's stories embedded in, for example, like, uh, like feminist scholarship that talks about how, you know, like um, if reason thinks about it is like perceived to be a certain way and is like the main characteristic, the, the main key distinguish characteristic of what makes us human is the fact that we can reason and then it's being labeled that like women don't have as much capacity as men to reason it makes men more human or like more true to the humanness and therefore justifies oppression of women on the basis that they don't have the characteristics that makes them kind of truly human so we can see that these these kinds of anthropocentric perspectives and beliefs are very much uh, they're shaping our engagement with the world, our engagement with each other, and the way we're going to go about also like solving problems. So one of the questions that I like to ask is if you think about environmental destruction, so the first point up there, you think about it's um, we know that the current state of environmental destruction is created by the human for the human. But then when we think about ways to solve the problem, how do we go about thinking about solutions? We think about what the human can do to do human actions to solve a human problem that is going to lead to benefits for the human, right? So even our, like the anthropocentric assumptions is leading to particular engagement with nature, but then even in the solutions that we're trying to find, we're still working within the same anthropocentric framework. That sometimes means that the solutions we can come up with can be pretty limited. So there are, again, there's a, this is the part where I start talking more about focusing on the perspective of Buddhist scholarship on the questions. And I'm going to start with Abe Masao. Uh, I'm also going to end with Abe Masao, but I'm going to start there because he gives what he believes to be explanations for why anthropocentrism came to be. Keep in mind, we can all agree to disagree. Uh, I'm relaying Abe Masao's perspective on this. I think it's an interesting one. Uh, and I think it'd be a really cool conversations to have after. So it gives primarily two reasons for how anthropocentrism came to be. The first one is the subject-object dualism that's coming from uh, Descartes, so Cartesian metaphysics. In a nutshell, in a nutshell, the idea is that the ego-based consciousness of a self, so your person, yourself. It creates discriminatory thinking where the subject possess the power to objectify others. So I am a self and because I am a self and I have reason, then I can decide like, oh, like I, I am a subject, therefore I have a self. And that gives me the capacity to decide what else is objects. And from there, 
by objectifying all things, the humans centralize all significance and meaning within themselves. So again, I perceive this to be this, and therefore it becomes this. But it's only this because you have centralized all meanings to be coming from you. Only a subject can define something else. An object cannot define oneself. So it creates a power dynamic between the subject, the thinking self, and other things that do not think on the same grounds as someone that possesses an ego or an ego-based consciousness. Also, the second reason is the Abrahamic religion's personalistic relationship with God. And here, more specifically, what is meant is that uh, Abrahamic religions posits that humans are created imago Dei, which means at the image of God. And that gives them a personalized responsibility to the word of God. And from there, since nature is ruled by God through humans, it places humans at a central role with regards to other beings, and it justifies their dominance over them. So Abbe Masao's perspective on this is, in a nutshell, is something around the lines of humans are made at the image of God, and we've been put at the top of the hierarchy. And because we've been put at the top of the hierarchy, then it means that it justifies dominance over whatever's under, uh, and sometimes under the command of God. So these are some of the explanations as to why it would have been created. We can see from this perspective that it's critical of, I guess, two of the core principles of Western ways of thinking. Um, and again, I'm going to dive a little bit more into that a little bit later. So now I'm going to move on to Saigyo. So Saigyo was a wandering poet uh, and also a monk from the Heian period, the late Heian period. Um, and today I'm just going to offer one poem from Saigyo that is my own translation. So bear with me if it's a bit, uh, it's, it's not perfect, but here we are. So Hototogisu, which is a bird. Uh, it's a, I think in English, it's like a mountain cuckoo or something like that. So Hototogisu, how should a person speak about not understanding a voice that is heard and longed for? So that would be the poem. Now, what you can notice here, there's two things that I want for us to notice. The first one is that there is an underpinning of the difficulties and the limits of the human mind and language to properly conceptualize and engage with particular experience. So here, it's there's a longing for something, there's a thing that's being experienced, but then how should you go about talking about it or about not, I, I hear something, but I don't really understand for. So what, what are you going to do with this? So it highlights the, the limits of the human mind to be able to think and conceptualize a particular thing. So that could just be a critique of the way humans work or our finitude as human beings. But the thing here that makes it a critique of, your, of anthropocentrism is that if you notice who is Saigyo asking? So here the answers will come precisely when one realizes that they're their own limits and turn towards nature's many teachers for guidance. So here it's like, hey, I'm a human. I lack particular kind of understanding. And then I'm going to ask the bird, going to be Hototogisu, how should I go about doing this? And that action, who is the interlocutor? Who are you asking? Where are you finding your answers? Here, you're not finding your answers in the human, in the human perspective, in the way the human would go about solving a problem. You're asking something that is not human. And just that interaction, just admitting the finitude and looking outside of the human truth to be able to find solutions or how to engage with a problem is already moving away from an anthropocentric view of how you should interact with the world. Now we're going to switch to Dogen. So Dogen, I think, has been introduced multiple times uh, in our in many presentations. So I'm not going to say much. Uh, he's he brought Soto Zen from from China uh, and he you know set up the school and he became extremely influential and he's become a major figure of uh, Zen Buddhism, whether in the Western world or in the the, the Eastern world. So. Well, today I'm going to talk about a passage from the chapter that's called Sansuikyo. So the uh, Sansuikyo is like the mount, uh, mountain and water fascicle. 
And what Dogen is saying here is insights into mountains should not be happening by means of the measure of human thought. Supposing that it is not similar to the flow of humans, why should someone carry doubts about whether mountains flow or do not flow? So here, again, there's a tackling of anthropocentricism in the idea that to flow or to walk, for example, because there's a passage that I, I thought about using that passage and I ended up choosing this one because he specifically says you should not look into mountains from using the measure of human thoughts. If you think about humans from the human perspective, you will never be able to say that the mountain flow because flow looks a particular way for you as a human. But outside of that, it might look differently. So he gives the same example with walking, he talks about the walking of the mountain. So why should a woman, why would you think that a mountain not walk because it doesn't walk the way a human does? If walking is not just a thing that human does, but for us, we would attribute walking to only what looks like what the human is doing because that's the anthropocentric assumptions. So again, we can see here in that passage from Dogen that there's a critique of that anthropocentric perspective, that there's a limit to what you can find with the measure of your human thought. And here, if humans are to be awakened to sunyata, to uh, emptiness, they need to experience reality for what it is, not just what it is for the human. And that's very important. Again, it's not just about what are things for the human. The goal is to kind of transcend that perspective to be able to uh, arrive to the thing as it is, right? Without the kind of filtering of the human perspective. And that is awakening to the to emptiness. And now going into uh, talking about Abe Masao, here I chose um, passages that you can find in two of his books, um, Zen and Western Thought and Buddhism and Interfaith Dialogue, because they're both available in English. So if ever you wanted to find the books for yourselves and kind of dig a little more what he has to say about anthropocentrism, uh, then like you'll have the capacity to do it uh, in English, which might be more comfortable for some of us. So the first passage here is that the dimensions of generation extinction itself common to both humans and other creatures is thereby overcome and the true reality is now disclosed universally. So I'm not going to talk about it too much now. I'm going to go to the second passage, which is, that dharma is the subject of its own self-awakening and you are the channel of its self-awakening. So here in both contexts of the, both of these quotes, we're talking about um, awakening and awakening to the true reality of the world, which is connected to what we were talking about from Dogen earlier. And the idea in here is that when you awaken to something so when you awaken, in this case, to truth, to shunyata, to all of the these terms, uh, it happens at a, the word that's used in the translation is like a dimensional event. It's not just a human experience. And what is meant by that is when reality is disclosed as it is, it's disclosed as it is, not just for the person that experiences it, but for the entirety of all beings that have also access to that reality. So a true awakening, when we talk about Satori, it's not just about the human personal experience. And it's necessary, it, the true awakening necessarily liberates all beings imprisoned in samsara, not just the human. And here we can see the, you know, the kind of bodhisattva path, you know, like being come into play, that it's not just about there is that, yes, there is an awakening of the self that is happening, but true liberation happens when all beings imprisoned in samsara are liberated, not just a human. So the experience of satori is not just human. It's not just something the human can do. It's not human centric in terms of experience, but it's also important that the real true awakening to the reality of all things is something that needs to benefit everyone, not just a human. So you can see in all of these quotes, we're moving away from focusing on the human experience. And it's actually mandatory that we move away from that experience if we are to awaken to sunyata or to reality as it is. So to conclude, 
there's uh, the key points that I wanted to make in this presentation have been the points that were highlighted by Motion Sense at the beginning. They're very simple points, but it's that first, critique of anthropocentrism are actually an integral part of Buddhism. Buddhism oh, says that anthropocentrism results from ego-driven ego framings of the world. So when we talk about the subject-object dichotomy, or this idea that you know um, uh, humans are made at the image of God, like he, he had says that these things are ego-driven framework framings of the world. From that, it creates an enormalized discriminatory thinking, and then it causes tremendous amounts of suffering for humans and non-humans alike, as we've seen in the you know that little sample of consequences of anthropocentrism. So just inherent to the way Buddhism teaches about things, it already criticizes this idea of like ego-driven and discriminatory thinking and I'm better than you are. And like, and all of this stuff is, you know, it's like the Four Noble Truth. It creates an, a, a tremendous amount of suffering for no humans and non-humans alike. So it, moving away from anthropocentrism is core. It's actually core to the Buddhist teachings. And also, solutions to anthropocentrism are also an integral part of Buddhism. So it's not just that it criticizes that engagement with the world, but it actually says that, hey, like we need to overcome this. It's so important to overcome this in order to alleviate suffering for ourselves and others. And there's ways to go about doing that. First of all, we have to let go of ourselves in order to prevent an ego-driven framework of the world. So if already you're able to let go of the self, of the ego-driven perspective, then the first part, the first stepping stone of anthropocentrism, which is an ego-driven framing of the world, it doesn't even happen. So if you're able to let go of the self, you will stop engaging with the world from an anthropocentric perspective. Also, cultivating wisdom breaks down discriminatory thinking. So wisdom as the one of the paramitas, you know, it's it's necessary within the context of cultivating the, the paramita of wisdom. It's necessary that you move away from a framework that is limited by the human mind. It's to be able to really engage with the world as it is, to be able to kind of transcend, to use that like language, to like transcend that like self-centered humor-driven perspective. And when you go there, then you attain wisdom and you can engage with the world from that place of wisdom which is going to generate compassion and all of the other uh, ripple effect of that that leads to uh, attaining bodhisattvahood and also segue into this the bodhisattva path necessitates collective liberation for all so again moving away from being like i me myself am going to be enlightened because it's going to feel amazing it's like, no, the, the bodhisattva path and the vow necessitates that we move away from that framework of focusing on the human experience and that we bring about collective liberation from all. And guess what? From a non-anthropocentric perspective, collective liberation of, let's say, like a tree. So a tree attaining liberation will not look like the way a human is going to attain liberation because that would be human, that would be anthropocentric to assume that it would. So once you transcend these, you let go of their self and you break down the discriminatory uh, thinking by building wisdom, then you start to be able to be in a place as a bodhisattva that you're able to use many forms of skillful means to help things attain and beings and non-beings attain liberation precisely because you're not stuck within that framework anymore. You can just engage with people where they are and as they are and provide whatever support they need to move towards collective liberation. So that is the presentation in a nutshell. I thought today I wanted specifically to try to make it maybe a little shorter because I feel like that conversation can bring about a lot of like questions and interactions and comments. So I like to leave lots of space for people to engage with it. Um, for those who might be interested, these are the, the sources that I use for today. Um, if you want, uh, I can just talk about it from my own personal experience. Uh, a really cool book to read to try to understand what would it look like to think about things in a non-anthropocentric perspective outside of the Buddhist teachings. Uh, this book, uh, Pathogenesis by Jonathan Kennedy.
this book. It basically, it specifically tries to move away from a uh, anthropocentric understanding of history and try to understand how did we come to be where we are looking specifically at like biology and specifically like viruses and plagues and like all these kinds of stuff and how disease and viruses have actually been a lot more of a mover of history than humans have historically since we can have data on this kind of stuff. So if you had like a, just a really interesting perspective book that kind of like, what would that look like to see something we all know of, of history, but from a non-anthropocentric perspective, I would recommend that book. I think it's a really cool and engaging place to start. Uh, but outside of that, I'm going to leave this, the floor open to questions and comments by, uh, by everybody. And thank you for listening to my talk today. Thank you, Maxine. And um, by, by the way, if, if I were still teaching biomedical anthropology courses, I would definitely be using Kennedy's book on the history of the eight plagues. I would I would use that in, uh, I, I taught a course in City and Human Health. And so that would have fit in really well. <laughs> yeah, I, I knew I knew that's exactly your, you know, as a as a anthropology and like having working with like medicine and biology and all that kind of stuff, I knew that this book would be right down your alley. Right. And um, so anybody wants to get it for me for, for New Year's, please go ahead. Um, <laughs> they don't send them to me anymore. Um, just, very, was, is it Yoshima Sensei? I don't, I don't know if it's or not. I can. I don't remember seeing him. Yeah, I didn't see him earlier. Okay. Um, let me just, let me just uh, make one comment about your presentation, and then I'll, I'll open it up. And that is that you were presenting um, the um, perspective from the Abrahamic traditions that put the human at the center as a extension of the divinity, if you will. Um, you, you could disagree with that. But I've often thought that rather than, than humans being a sort of an accomplice to the, the God notion, I think in many ways, we see a kind of struggle between humans, God, and nature. It's a struggle as opposed to a co-option, if you will. And But that doesn't mean that the humans are any less anthropocentric in that. <laughs> they're, they're equally anthropocentric. It's just that we, we begin to look at it in a slightly different way. <clears throat> and that view actually is, is a Cartesian view also. Of the of the struggle between nature and God and humans that came out of the Romantic period of of philosophy and and Cartesian philosophy specifically, and so what's interesting is that for my and and I'm certainly not an authority on Western philosophy. I'm much more in, uh, involved in Eastern philosophy, but I think that's one of the characteristics that distinguishes Eastern philosophy from Western philosophy is the, the notion of the human being at the center of the universe, whereas what Eastern philosophy sees the human as a component of the universe. <clears throat> so I, I don't know if you have any comments about that, Maxine. Um, my understanding is pretty much exactly the same as you. Uh, and that is one of the things that I really, really, really appreciate that first draw me to East Asian philosophy and to eventually become a practitioner myself. Uh, and my study of Western philosophy has confirmed that for me. Uh, and I think Abe Masao has, has some uh, very good insights about where that come from. But yeah, I, I agree. I think that there's, and if you think about, you know, the the kind of structures that have been created. Uh, think about, you know, like I'm thinking like capitalism and all these different kinds of, you know, structures that are there are very much embedded. Like you, you can see when you dig into like, you know, like liberalism, neoliberalism, all these kinds of stuff. Like if you, if you kind of like apply an anthropocentric reading of it, you can see anthropocentricism at the core of all of these structures that oftentimes have resulted in a lot of a lot of oppression. And there's also non-anthropocentric you know, perspective that has resulted in, in oppression in, in East Asia as well. But um, yeah, to me, I think it's, uh, I think it, it is a, 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 I perceive anthropocentrism to be a problem. 
And whether you look at perspective from Taoism, Buddhism, and a bunch of different East Asian philosophy, uh, it's almost there's almost an inherent critique of anthropocentrism at the core of it all that is really about advocating for this kind of more like you are part of a whole rather than the whole being kind of like um, like you being separate and more unique and different. It doesn't mean that there's particular characteristics of the humans that is, you know, specific to whatever. But then why should that be deemed superior? Why would that should give you the the um, what is it like the the red, the, the green light to be able to go dominate and, you know, dominate nature and animals and beings. And so so that's that's the, the, the difference. And it's something that I really appreciate about East Asian philosophy, not just in Buddhism, but I think Buddhism really has a clear framework on how to overcome anthropocentrism while really clearly explaining why it's important to overcome these assumptions that we have. Thank you. And by the way, I'm not I'm not proposing that we ban uh, Cartesian books from our, <laughs> our bookstores. Yeah. Don't, don't give, um, uh, and I'll go ahead and uh, stop the recording if we. Yeah, we'll stop.